Hi, everyone. So we're here with Roy today, who is a specialist in taxation in Japan. So thanks a lot for joining us today, Roy. And if you wouldn't mind starting by explaining your experience in a little bit more detail and how you've helped companies and expats in particular, that would be fantastic. Sure. Thanks for having me, Adam. Hi, uh, my name is Roy Uehara. I'm a tax Japan tax director at Vialto Partners uh, here in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I've been with this uh, uh, business for over 20 years, particularly helping out with the uh, globally mobile em employees like expa expatriates coming in and out of Japan, their personal tax matters. So uh, yeah, my specialty is the, um, the individual tax reporting of those more cross-border type of transactions. And that's, yeah, that's why, that's what I do. Fantastic. Now, the Japanese tax system, like many tax systems around the world, has changed a bit in the last few years. What would you say the major high level changes have been when it comes to the kinds of taxes that expats and companies might have to pay? Sure. I think a few changes that happened over the past several years, uh, most particularly uh, some changes around so-called non-permanent resident taxpayers. Uh, Adam, maybe you know you 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 know this, uh, but individuals, non-Japanese, so foreign nationals, uh, living in Japan for less than five years, they're under the status quo non-permanent resident. Essentially, only Japan-related income is taxable, Japan source income. However, there's a slight update, and uh, for example, although most of you their uh, personal investments outside of Japan is still not taxable, like bank interest or dividends from stocks or whatnot. But uh, capital gains from sale of stocks is now taxable, even for the for non-permanent residents who have lived in Japan less than five years. So uh, th those people who are used to you know being completely excluded from a Japan tax system put on their overseas investment income, that's a kind of a major change that people need to watch out for. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. And speaking about mistakes, what are the major mistakes that you've seen companies and expats make when it comes to their taxation in Japan? I think uh, there are a few things, but one of the uh, common ones that we have come across is the residency issue. Um, uh, I think the very that style of the uh, assignment really changed over time. You know, in the past, it's more of a really conventional, uh, some executive sent over from home um, entity to Japan for like three year assignment, you know, everything, everything's permanent. I mean, not, not permanent, but the long term, uh, clear cut as to who, you know, which country the individuals are living or not. But more recently, their flexibility on the arrangement. So many of them are sent over here on a business trip, uh, you know, more like, more like a business traveler status and or short-term assignments, or even the remote um, work, right? You know, maybe assigned to Japan, but not necessarily physically living in Japan. So those flexibility really translate into more complexity on the Japan tax treatments. And the common mistake is that, okay, well, you know, if, if the individual's in Japan for less than 183 days, and automatically that person should not have any tax implication in Japan. It's not simple as that. You know, we really need to look into each case um, individually. And, and quite often, we have to even look into the tax treaty to see whether the particular treaty between the sending country, home country, and host country, which is Japan, whether there's any uh, provision to exempt the particular income. Otherwise, you know, by default, it is taxable. So, um, yeah, it's really the, the companies or in, in, in the assignees themselves as well, they really need to pay attention to their own cases to see whether there's any hiccup uh, that you know, they, they may run into by not knowing the, the specific domestic rules here in Japan. Sure, and that leads me to something, and that's that compared to five or ten years ago, there are a lot more kind of uh, digital nomads and remote workers because... Of course, historically, there's always been high net wealth individuals who have had stocks and shares and other things offshore and dividends. But now there's a much wider range of people living in Japan. And I think there is now a nomad visa or a digital nomad visa, if I'm not mistaken, 
in Japan. So would you say for these people, the situation is much more complicated taxation wise than they might assume? Or would you say it's relatively straightforward? Yeah, I mean, can, can I cannot say in general, generally, uh, in one single statement, uh, it really depends on the person's circumstances. But um, it's important to understand at least the rules, you know, whether they are subject to certain type of a tax implications or not based on their particular status. And the good thing you uh, mentioned, Adam, about the visa status, um, you know, many years ago, visa or immigration status and tax is really not connected, right? So, you know, uh, whatever the visa status you have, okay, that really doesn't have a direct impact on the Japanese tax implications. But nowadays, some of those Japanese tax provisions do include visa status conditions. So uh, it's a very important to understand what type of a visa status they're on. Uh, digital nomad may be a list of a direct impact, but uh, uh, common, you know, the experience we have is the, even for uh, someone who have lived here for relatively short, like two, three years, but if they're eligible to apply for the permanent resident visa, for example, that does have uh, tax implications in some areas. So as much as there are some benefits of uh, having that kind of a permanent visa status, you know, whether it's a permanent resident visa or other types, they also need to look into see if there's any surprise on the tax side. Uh, and, you know, you just need to wait between the uh, uh, benefits and, and, uh, and the disadvantage to see which, what works best for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, as you say, it's a very individualized situation, By right? Everyone's individual situation might be a bit different, which kind of leads me to the final question. And that's that if someone wants to kind of contact you to get formal legal, or should I say tax advice, uh, how can they do so? What's the best way of contacting you? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we do have a website for Vialto Partners. Uh, it's it's a global company, so uh, we have a global website, but also there is a website for Japan. Uh, the professionals here in Japan, we're happy to assist you. Whether it's an inbound case or the uh, Japanese companies who are thinking to send the individuals uh, overseas, uh, either directions, we're happy, happy to assist so please look up for the Vialto partners on the website and um, uh, the representative or contact you to see how we can help. Uh, just to you know that not only we do uh, tax services, but we also provide the visa and immigration services, HL consulting services, payroll services, you know, employment tax, like a sort of Japanese social security, uh, social insurance tax matters as well. So quite all around uh, uh, associated with individuals that we can help. So yeah, uh, just do do contact us and we're happy to help. Well, that's fantastic, Roy. And actually, before you go, there was one final thing that just popped into my mind. And it's something that many people ask me if they're based in Japan for some time, and that's inheritance tax. Now, again, that can be quite a complicated area, right? But would you say there are some obvious things people should be aware of as foreigners living in Japan with overseas assets when it comes to Japanese inheritance tax, which I believe is very high? Yes, yep, it could go as much as 55%, and uh, definitely not uh, low tax rate here in Japan on the asset type of you know uh, tax, which is gift or inheritance tax. Yeah, so you're right about that, Adam. Um, Gift and inheritance tax rules in Japan are very complex, so um, hard, you know, very difficult to just mention in the simple words. But I do uh, recommend people listening to this uh, to make sure that um, that their visa status, how they may impact even on the gift or inheritance tax uh, regime, because they depend on their visa status. Sometimes they may be eligible for certain exemption. Uh, but by default, uh, you know, just keep in mind that not only the assets located in Japan, but the assets out located outside of Japan could be subject to Japanese gift or inheritance tax. So definitely, you know, advanced planning is some uh, it's 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 worth it. So before they take action, of course, inheritance tax is something. Sometimes it's very difficult to plan, but um, uh, you know, it's sometimes it happens suddenly. But certainly recommend. Uh, 
people to start planning to see what kind of Japanese tax implications they may have based on their certain circumstances. Yeah, and absolutely. And even if people can't plan it away in terms of not paying it, there can be solutions like getting a life insurance policy and, and things like that. Obviously, that's the kind of thing we deal with and we can't give formal advice. And obviously, everything on this video is not formal tax, legal or financial advice, but it is something to uh, you know think about, really, especially if you're high net worth and going to be spending time in Japan and going to permanently reside there.